Aloha and welcome to Inside Hawaii Real Estate. I'm Will Tanaka with my co-host, business partner and wife, Leonie Lab. Thanks, Will. Together as full-time realtors, we're bringing you the latest in Hawaii real estate. And today, we're going to unlock the secrets of the title insurance industry in Hawaii. We'd like to give a really warm welcome to Will Salvatera, Senior Title Officer at First Hawaii Title Corporation, one of the longest standing escrow and title companies in Hawaii since the 1980s. And Will is an expert in title insurance. He's been in the industry for 25 years, title, he did a little bit of escrow. He was also on the lending side. So you had the trifecta, Will. So welcome. Thank you, everyone. Aloha. Welcome. Uh, we'll call you Mr. Salvatera, so it's easier for me. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Mr. Salvatera. So, you know, title insurance is something that's vital to any real estate transaction, but one that is often overlooked by consumers. In a real estate transaction, title report is generated by the title company at the beginning of escrow. And as a buyer, you usually have, about, have five to 10 days to review. If there's any issues, you raise it with the title company and the seller's agent. And it's one of the out clauses, the review of the title. So it's a way to cancel the transaction within a certain time frame and still get your deposit back. So it's so important in so many ways. So, Mr. Salvatera, let's start with the basics. What is title okay. insurance? That's the big question. Uh, a lot of consumers come out and ask, why do we need title insurance? Well, uh, to protect what could possibly be one of the most uh, important investments you'll ever make, and that's the investment of your home. Uh, title insurance policy, with a title in insurance policy, you as the owner, uh, have an indemnity contract that will reimburse you for any loss in the event of uh, someone asserts a claim against your property um, and you'll be covered by that policy. I mean, because simply put, so basically every property, you know, has a title report, which is essentially like a history of everything that was recorded. So it's like a history about the land and the property. And I feel like it's similar to like a medical history for a person, right? So like you go to the doctor's office, there's a file. It has like a whole history about your medical situations and whatnot. So this is kind of like what it is for a property where there's like a report that's comprehensive that includes everything that was recorded. So what would be items that would be recorded regarding a property besides ownership? For condominiums, you'd see declarations, uh, you'd see grants of easements, you would see uh, encroachment agreements if you're lots, any, any agreements that was recorded, declarations, anything pertaining to the property, how it is, would have been recorded. We will show it pertaining to that property um, and access easements and so forth. If there's anything that's recorded pertaining to the property it, it and it was recorded, we can find it. We'll, we'll find it from the, the records of the Bureau of Convinces and we'll re show it on our commitment or title report. And so kind of your role in all of this is you'll take a look at the report and you'll kind of make the diagnosis to see like, is everything clear and as it should be? Or is are you seeing something on there that shouldn't be there? When we do our searches, we'll normally put everything of record. Uh, now, everything flows smoothly in title. We'll show it. And if there are any uh, discrepancies. Uh, we'll, we like to uh, note it on the commitment or the title report that we issue uh, just to bring it out for future conversation on, on how to fix certain issues um, that we may see come about in the upcoming transactions moving forward. You know, title insurance is so interesting because it, it's very unique. Mm -hmm. You know, you have, you know, most people have car insurance or homeowners insurance and it covers then for an event that happens in the future, right? That's like correct. Me and Mr. Salvatera has been talking about it's it covers for an event that happened in the past. So it, it, it's kind of interesting in terms of from a consumer standpoint, you know, you talked about easements and you talked about um, encroachments. And oftentimes when you look at a title report, there's a page that says exceptions. So generally speaking, those are, I mean, it doesn't have to be bad, but those are um, issues or items that's not covered by title insurance. And sometimes it's 10 to 15 items. Sometimes it's like 40 to 50 items. So from a consumer standpoint, 
it's like you're looking at all this and how, how do you decipher? So in, in terms of well, well, what what do you think um, a general consumer should be looking for when they're looking at all these exceptions? What's important is that we try to hyperlink all these documents so you, the consumer or agents can, can read these documents. Um, they could be you know, very old documents, but it it's technically has information on what the property went through, whether it be uh, grants of easements where the property holder granted an easement to a co- the county or, or the state uh, for an easement, or it's just about history or doc- you, the documents will technically tell you what those documents were doing, uh, such as uh, if it's again, it's a condominium, you have your declarations, all the amendments to the declarations are there. So all the recorded documents are not necessarily bad, like you said. They're just documents of information that pertains to the property and are exceptions in our commitment. As far as the um, items to look out for, uh, take a look to see if there's any liens, outstanding liens, or mm-hmm. any judgments, tax liens. Maybe not under you, or maybe it could be from a previous owner. Those are just certain things that you would want to look for on your title reports. One thing that we saw, you know, where we see sometimes, and we had this recently, was where on a title report, there was a mortgage that was done by a prior owner, but it was still showing up there and on, on the title report, and it was still showing as like it had never been recorded as closed. Okay. So um, yeah, that that's a common thing because uh, once a mortgage has been paid off, like if a property was sold, escrow pays off the uh, existing mortgage. The lenders who are paid off normally takes some time to, to get the release of mortgage drafted, they either send it back to the title company or they try and record it themselves. So oftentimes you'll see from a report that there's an existing uh, lien mortgage that that pertains to a, a previous buyer or previous owner. Within the title companies, we try to, uh, when we do our search, we try to make sure that those liens were paid off. We we do contact each other internally with within the title companies, and we try to ask for indemnities. And uh, you know, we confirm that someone took care of that lien, and we just put notice out there, and they'll try to to accommodate and and request for a proper release of that lien. Then that allows us internally, uh, depending on what company to make certain calls. Some people will issue endorsements to cover that unrecorded lien, or we, as long as we are indemnified of that lien or it was verified that it was paid off, we can make a decision on on what to do and how to handle that lien moving forward. Because if that's outstanding, then it affects the insuratability of it? By leaving it on the title report, yes, it does. Uh, Having it unreleased, Versus it being paid off, but a release hasn't been recorded. Um, you know, it seems like the same outcome, but it's, it, there's a difference there. Uh, if we can verify that the lease was paid off, an indemnity agreement within the title companies will allow for certain things, mm-hmm. especially for us to make sure that it's not a big risk to, to whom we're insuring. We could possibly uh, remove that lien of, of record or even pursue a release ourselves. Mr. Salvatore, okay, I'd like to talk about transfer on death fees because yes. I've seen that in a couple of transactions more recently. And, and oftentimes it could be a situation where the parents gifted the property to their kids, but in exchange, um, they have to allow the parents to live it in the property until their death. So we often see uh, transfer of death deeds um, and they're recorded. It doesn't necessarily mean title changes hands right away. It's a document of record. And when the principal, whom the, usually the title holder, once they're deceased, the transfer of uh, death deed usually kicks in and will convey the property to the beneficiaries as noted on that document. So from a title standpoint, we take a look at that. Uh, we need to make sure the death certificate it's in a regular system, be provided and an affidavit of some sort be recorded to make it public record, 
right? Um, now, if it's a land court property, it needs to be petitioned and acknowledge that the transfer of death deed is the new conveyance document that conveys the property to the beneficiaries. And actually, my apologies. That was a life estate example, not a transfer of deed example. Mm -hmm. So I, I just confused everyone. But yeah, transfer on death deed is it, it does pass to the the uh, the named beneficiary upon the death. Let's move on to the life estate situation. Oh, okay, Wait. life estate. Yes. I'm just kind of wondering about the transfer of death. Like, how does that differ from the trust? Because the trust. Well, it they are the same. They technically do the same thing. Uh, so it, it is still a life estate, um, I guess, tool. The trust involves uh, a documentation, a trust that's created by, I guess, an attorney, um, which inter which has everything, um, property, everything under the sun, I guess, can be noted in the trust, right? Exactly. Whereas a, a life estate, not life estate, but a transfer of death deed um, is technically for just the ownership of this specific property that they're they're recording. And so they just know beneficiaries. It's for strictly the property. Well, Tanaka, you're talking about the, the life estate, right? As being another, or was that the... So the example that I was meaning to give is sometimes a home is gifted or sold at a discount to the children mm -hmm. or, or some type of beneficiaries. And they exchange the, the grand tour often the parents, they get to live there right. for um, for life until they pass. Got it. So how does it work in terms of selling a property that's that has a life estate interest? Sure. Uh, so, so if the party that reserved the life estate unto themselves, if they're still alive, uh, we will require them to be included in the conveyance document. They'll need to mm -hmm. sign off as grantors as to their life estate interests. And it's it's a conveyance of interest as any other interest, right? Um, now, if if that person is deceased, now if it it changes between the two type of systems that we have. Regular system, um, client will need to provide us with a death certificate, and the life estate interest will will um, technically um, be removed. Now, however, if it's a land court type property, they would still need to go and do the land court petition to note the party's death, the, the life estate interest death, and then um, have that removed that way before the parties can convey the uh, property. And you bring up about Hawaii's uh, recording system. So we have two of them, regular system and land court. And I feel like, are we one of the only states that has like two different systems? No, I, I believe there's a few states out there. I just don't know which one. I haven't really dealt with other states. So I'm sorry for that, inf not having that information. But Hawaii has a dual system, uh, two system type property, which is a torrent system, which is what we call land court. And the abstract system, which is the race system. So in a race system property, it's first recording, you know, it takes priority, right? They'll accept pretty much every document at the Bureau of Conveyances. As far as, as long as it's recordable, they'll just take it. Whereas the land court system is a guaranteed system where there's issuance of transfer certificate of title. The state technically guarantees you title based on on the recording of documents. It's a little bit the strict, we call it the stricter of the two systems because there's a little bit more things involved. Uh, you need to have full names. You need to have uh, name your spouse on there. You can't just put a, uh, a general marital status. Uh, and any changes to the vesting in title will need to go through the petition via, uh, to the land court office. Um, so that makes a little bit more uh, things that you need to take care of in the land court system rather than the regular system side. And is it true, like, when it is a land court property that sometimes getting those things recorded and it, it could take a little bit longer in the course of a real estate transaction? Yes, it does. Uh, and for example, I'll give you an example. Like, person is on title uh, as unmarried and they, uh, they got married, right? And to note, the marital status change, they would 
we would require a copy of the marriage certificate, get a petition drafted, have them sign it. Now, after signing, we have to send it over to uh, the land court office. So that takes additional maybe uh, 10 to 15 days sometimes. So we need to have that petition. Once it's filed at land court, then we can take that that filed petition and now have to record it at the Bureau of Conveyances to put it on record. So it, it does have, a, you know, it, it provides additional dates and, and attorney's fees and record and filing fees with the land court. But on the bright side to that, like all of those types of matters that need to be handled is something that your company would encompass and help a client get done. Oh, definitely. Our escrow officers um, will normally contact a drafting attorney, an attorney that will draft a petition and um, acquire all the information. We'll review the docs and have someone take it over to land court for uh, filing. So it sounds complicated, but actually folks will make it really easy. Oh, of course. We, we will try to make it as easy as possible. And, you know, we'll request for the documents that we require or land court requires, not necessarily us. We do like to see them too, but we'll. it's those documents that the land court requires to make sure the petition is done properly. So it sounds like, you know, if I was an owner, I would want the state of Hawaii to guarantee title to the property. So land court would be preferable at the same time when you're trying to sell and there's a change in vesting, change in title. It's a little bit more cumbersome. There's additional cost. So, I mean, you can't choose what, you know, recording system you're in. Sometimes it could, it could be in both, right? So right. it's almost like, well... As long as when you're selling the property and when you're purchasing, you kind of know, okay, is it regular system, the abstract system, is it land core system, or is it a double system? Right. Yeah. Identification is the key. And again, having that title report or, you know, the preliminary title report or the commitment up front, reviewing it, um, having conversations with your agent, uh, even your escrow officer, I mean, all that will make sure uh, the process uh, goes a little bit smoother um, to identify certain things that needs to be um, handled. In a situation where there's a title commitment or title report issued, you know, at the beginning of a transaction, and then in the middle of the transaction, something changes on it? Uh, sometimes that happens. I mean, uh, our report goes out and something or someone records something on the property and, and we later find out. So if, if there's a deed that's recorded, we have to update our report. At, you know, we try to keep our reports within a 30-day period. But if we do update our report and we do have findings, then we have to update our report and make sure we, we provide that information to all the parties involved. Whether it be some a lien being put on your property, someone puts a judgment, or somebody tries to cloud your title. There could be possible um, scenarios. There are times, instances that they do occur from time to time. You know, earlier you talked about encroachments. Mm -hmm. So for any single family home, um, almost always you'll get a survey. Done. Correct. And some, sometimes there could be rock walls on the subject property that's encroaching onto the neighbors. For Hawaii, the, the minimum is so anything over six inches is considered a... Um, significant encroachment where you you know where the buyer may, may request a seller to get an encroachment agreement mm -hmm. so from a title insurance standpoint whether there is the encroachment is like 0.1 feet like 1.25 inches or several feet how do how do you deal with that uh okay so let me clarify the uh the de minimis uh for residential properties yes 0.5 feet but there's also commercial spaces and agricultural sp spaces that vary um, in terms of amount of encroachment to be de minimis. But talking residential here, yes, 0.5 feet, six inches. How do we determine that? Uh, if, if, you know, we read the survey report and if it is within de minimis, again, there's a lot of different ways title companies approach this, whether they do show the de minimis items or they're just gonna show the encroachment items. Now, if it's an encroachment item, we'll show it on our report and make sure everyone's notified what the encroachments are. And we leave it, we generally leave it up to the parties, buyer and sellers, to see um, how to remedy uh, those encroachments. We're already showing them as an exceptions. 
in our commitment report. So um, we could kind of stay away from uh, out of it after that. It, it's between buyer and seller. So if there's any encroachments that the buyer doesn't like, the title company doesn't get involved. It's between the buyer and the seller. That is correct. We, we, we're not going to be involved at that point. Our, our involvement is to show that there is an encroachment based on the survey that we received and reviewed. And it will be between buyer and seller, whether they want to remedy that via an encroachment agreement, or if it's possible, if it's an encroachment that is removable, you know, that, that's another option. And if there's a lender involved, they don't, no lender likes encroachments. So Correct. if they see encroachments on the title report, what would you do? Well, what does the title company do? Well, the lender normally will ask us for um, coverage over that endorsement, which we normally do. Most title companies do provide the lenders coverage over that encroachment as it's a little bit less risk uh, to provide that coverage to the lenders. Yeah, and then you just mentioned that lenders don't like encroachments. Is there anything else that you see that lenders don't like from the title standpoint? Of course, the, the, the liens, uh, they, they're... Uh, They'll tell us what they're they um, what they want on, on the we have our requirements on our commitments mm -hmm. as far as issuing free and clear title. Um, the lenders will most lenders will request uh, certain types of endorsements, and if we're allowed to provide those endorsements, we will. Um, of course, the encroachments is is the number one thing that they want coverage of um, if there are any. Um, Aside from that, they're usually pretty good with everything else that we show um, because we normally show a clear in the title, except for the, the new mortgage that, that we're insuring them for first lien position. In uh, many of our real estate transactions or just over the years, oftentimes either the buyer's side or the seller's side, they'll use a power of attorney. So, you know, th there's a situation where maybe... Um, one of the couple is um, traveling you know, for business and they're not going to be around. So they might use a POA, power of attorney, that situation. But there's been other situations in the past where they signed a POA, let's say 10 years ago, right? Uh, the mother and uh, owns a property. They, she signed a POA in favor of her daughter. And as of now, the, the mother has dementia and um from the medical standpoint, she's mentally incapable to make decisions and sign off on conveyance documents mm -hmm. or in, you know, related to, to real estate. So from your standpoint, how would title and escrow handle that type of situation? That's result? a great question. We do come across a lot of power of attorneys and we review them, make sure uh, they're up to date. Um, but in the case of what you mentioned, uh, a power of attorney that is a durable power of attorney, well, I'll, you know, it remains in effect even upon incapacity, whereas a general power of attorney expires upon incapacity. So again, we review the different types of power of attorneys that's, that's presented to us. And we like to prefer a specific or a special power of attorney pertaining just to the transaction for the sale of the transaction or for the purchase mm -hmm. of that transaction. However, it's not always like that. A power of attorney that was done 10 years ago, um, we as a title company will still like to make sure that the power of attorney is still in effect. Um, we try to prevent fraud that way. I mean, relationships doesn't last, uh, sometimes changes over the past 10 years. And we make sure we contact the principal uh, that they're still, the power of attorney is still in place. Now, in your example, if it is a durable power of attorney and, and um, say a daughter was given the power of attorney and all of a sudden the parent uh, has became, became incapacitated in that point, um, the durable power of attorney does allow, it does not expire upon incapacity. So uh, we'll take that uh, power of attorney and, and, and be able to, to move on with that. You're a wealth of knowledge, Will <laughs> Sabatera. Thank you. Is I learned some any... of that from you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're the man. Um, any fun stories or... Um, any exciting or something that you might want to share about, you know, what you've recently dealt with from a, a title officer standpoint, something to watch out for, for our consumers? 
uh, something to watch out for. Uh, just make sure that the person that's coming in to sign um, contracts or moving forward are, are the person that's on title. Um, if if they're not, then the questions start rolling, right? Like how how, especially with trust, if the original trustee or settler of the trust is is no longer able to be be a trustee, becomes a successor trustee. So just identifying who who who's the right. Uh, authority to to sign on behalf of the property. Um, I recently, I'll give out an example. I recently had a, a property in which we vested title based on the deed. It was the husband as trustee of the wife's trust. Okay. And normally when there's a trust involved, we would like to see a copy of the trust. We were given a copy of the trust. It's the wife's trust. Escrow officer tells us that the wife as trustee will be signing on the wife's trust. Now, my report is showing the husband as trustee of the wife's trust. So now I'm questioning it. I was like, why is why did they take title with the husband as trustee? Mm -hmm. And as, is there something that happened with the wife? The trust clearly states that the trust clearly states that the wife is the trustee. Was there an incapacity that I don't know about? Was um it's not a death because they said the wife is coming in saying she's the signer. It, it, it just didn't match, right? And my question was, how, what, how, in what capacity did the husband purchase or receive the property as trustee? Mm -hmm. And sure enough, after you know going back and forth with with the clients, they did a mistake when they acquired um, the property. They noted the husband instead of the wife as trustee. Because this was a regular system property and not land court, you know, there could have been several scenarios where you could have done to fix that, whether it could be a correction deed or have them sign affidavit, make sure, confirm who the actual trustee is. Because the property is vested under the trust. We made sure that the wife was the actual trustee and had vested property under the wife as trustee instead. So. There were several things that we needed to make sure to follow up on. You know, certain discrepancies like that, you know, identifying what happened, where the issues were. That That's very helpful. So it's always a plus to review these reports uh, once you get them. Fascinating world of the title insurance <laughs> industry. You are amazing, Will Sabatera. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Will, for being with us today, Mr. Salvatera. I appreciate it. Thank you. It's always uh, nice to to come on and, and be able to help uh, and assist and provide information. Thank you so much. You're awesome. Mahalo. Thank you. Aloha.